lectures, the teachers, and respected guests, co -leaves. I'm deeply humbled to give you the valedictory address. So my pranams, my namaskarams to all of you. I hope to start with that. I also take, I beg your apology that I cannot speak in Hindi. I speak Kannada, Tamil, a little bit of Malayalam. I can read and write Hindi, but I can't speak Hindi. <laughs> So please forgive me that I'm speaking in English. So a, a little bit about uh, uh, so a little bit about uh, uh, Indian history awareness and research. This is a group, a think tank with some professionals based in uh, Houston, in uh, Coimbatore, Bengaluru, and uh, several other places. So we try to research Indian history with an Indic lens as opposed to. Uh, other mainstream narratives that we see. And our speciality is that we are professionals who are engineers, who are doctors, who are economists, and professors of humanities. So we bring the uh, lens afforded by technology and science to validate some of our narratives. So that said, I'm very, very happy to present uh, uh, a valid, valedictory address today on roots of music. So once again, would like to apply a scientific lens to see the roots of music and try to address uh, how, how music evolved in these parts of the world. So we are often told that music is a universal language and what we observe is it's become a standard worldwide and that makes us sit up and wonder how this is possible. So the modern opinion is that music evolved independently in India, China and the West. And this has opened up some questions. How did similarly spaced scales evolve in Indian and Western music? What accounts for the commonality of instruments you see worldwide? So I'm going to address both of these things in a brief investigation of the history of music. So if you, if you read this uh, book by Swami Pagnyananda from uh, uh, Ramakrishna Math, he, in 1963, wrote this book, A History of Indian Music, in which he identifies things everybody in this audience already knows. There's a Vaidika music, which found a root in Samagana, and the Laukika music, popular, which found in uh, Gandharva music. So uh, Swamiji, he makes three periodizations. He says the ancient is from the most ancient times to the end of the 12th century. The medieval times from the 13th century to the 18th century current year, and the modern, the subsequent period. And the Swamiji also notes that if we talk about the history of Indian music, we have to talk about microtone, tone, and all of these other uh, entities I've listed over here. I'm not going to read it out. And the bottom line is you have to see the philosophical concept, and it's very important to see how everything fits in the uh, history of Indian music. So I'd like to start at the very beginning about Shruti and Octi. So the source that we have for this is the Chandogya Upanishad. This mentions the division of the octave into 22 parts, in which the Shruti is said to be the smallest interval of pitch which the human ear is able to hear. And from that, Swaras scale, Swaras are selected pitches to construct a scale or a raga about seven per octave as in the Natya Shastra. So if you look at uh, this graphic that I've shown over here, I don't think there is a pointer here. So this pointer won't work on the screen. It does. No, it doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't. That's okay. That's all right. So uh, at the very top, you see the root note sa. Note is sa, then you have the, all the others, ra, uh, sa, ri, ga, ma, pa, da, ni, sa. There are seven vaswaras at the top. Sa is the fixed note, and pa is the fixed note. And you see that when it's divided into semitones, you have the 12 semitones showing up over there. And a division of those 12 semitones further gave rise to the 22 shrutis. So only in this we work backwards from here. In the 22 shrutis, we work the 12 uh, semitones, and we work the seven swaras, and the root notes of sa and pa over there. In the 
Indian context, the swaras have always been associated with divinities also. For example, Sarat, Agni, Rivet, Brahma, Gavit, Saraswati, Ma, Mahadeva, Ha, Lakshmi, Ra, Ganesha, and Ni, Surya. This also gives us some hints about the antiquity of some of the musical systems. We will talk about that. So, one would like to see how did music evolve in India itself. It turns out that the most initial music in the Samagana was three notes only. And the notes are as they call the Uttata, the Anudatta, and the Swarita. And this person, uh, Dr. Srinivasa Rao, he notes that the initial, the Vanavina, that had only three strings, one for each note, and was used for singing these very early uh, notes. If you look at this uh, Naradiya Siksha in these verses, you see the inspiration for the seven note swaras. Each of these are supposed to be based on some sounds of some animals. For example, the heron or the goat or the bull, peacock, elephant, horse. So these give the inspiration for the sounds according to uh, the evolution in uh, uh, Naradiya Siksha. At this point, I'd like to talk about the relationship between music in the East and the West. So the 12 Shrutis can be mapped to the 12 semitones of the Western music, and that is shown in that circle over there that tells you about the different tones. So in the European practice, the octave has been divided into 12 semitones with exactly the same width, that is, with the same vibrational fraction. If you see a little picture over there, it says the octave is divided in equal temperament meaning that starting with the note C, C can roughly correspond with Sa. Starting with C all the way to the next octave is a two frequency difference, a double the frequency, and they divide each semitone into something they call cents. Each is a hundred cents. So that means the 12 uh, semitones will account for 1,200 cents. And there's a reason why I'm telling you all these things, because I want to find the relationship between Western music and the Indic music. So the relationship between Carnatic, Hindustani, uh, West, and Western, we know very well that uh, the different notes I've put on over here, and the names in the Carnatic system, and the names in the Hindustani system, and the corresponding names in the Western notation, as uh, are played on the keyboard also, and we can see the various semitones. So to first look at the history of how music would have impacted various parts of the world. Now, this is, this is where I'm coming from. My group researches the history of the Indian civilization. And we find that there are many things in the Indian civilization that have impacted the rest of the world. Whether it's in science, whether it's in technology, whether it's in mathematics, medicine, or anything else. Our research has shown that in various periods of time, Indian thought has impacted other world civilizations. And that's the list, we have given a list of these in our various talks and publications. So I try to apply the same lens over here to see whether Indian music could have impacted the Greeks. Although we are told that music arose independently in various parts of the world, would have liked to see what kind of impact is there. So this uh, is a publication from a person called Fadi Gone. And in 1963, he wrote this on studies of the Samaveda. So he comes out with a statement that the oldest form of the Samavedic scale was a pentatonic, five notes, and he provides these, for example, A, G, E, D, E, or E, D in the Western scale, and so on. He also wrote this very strange paragraph over here, where he saw what is the connection between the Greek music and the Indian music. He said, now we know that Pythagoras preached metamorphosis at about the same time in the Upanishads, the samsara was propagated. Then the same Greek philosopher and scholar laid down the foundation of geometry when the theorem called after him was in India practically applied according to the Sura Sutras, the construction of Alta. By analogy, we may for the present surmise that the minute study of musical intervals in India took place at about the end of the Vedic period. The consequence of this study was that the originally very simple pentatonic scale was gradually replaced by the intricate Shruti system with the quintal, the tertial, and the septimal tuning and its great variety of grammas, murchanas, ragas, and others. So this is his proposition. So this led me to start thinking. Somebody is now talking about how Samaveda and the Greeks are being talked about in the same breath. So let us do a deeper investigation and find out is there any further connection? What else can we infer from this? 
In other words, we are trying to critique the idea that music grows independently in different parts of the world. So the first thing is because we talked about Pythagoras, we need to see who is Pythagoras and what kind of music system did he get into the West. So the Pythagorean music is uh, uh, called as diatonic music. And in the Western notation, it is derived from the circle of fifth, what they call circle of fifth. We'll talk about that in just a minute. And he starts with the note F, F, C, G, D, A, B, B. It's not arranged in order, as you can see, because of the distance in the circle of fifth that gives this thing. In doing so, they evolved a pattern for the major scale of the form tone, tone, semitone, tone, 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 semitone. That was the way they emerged this major scale. And this is also there in some of our ragas. You can see similar structure appearing in the raga rows. So for example, I've shown the notes in the C major scale, where you have C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, the white keys in the keyboard, which you can play. And there is an integral sequence that is tone, tone, semitone, tone, 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 semitone. Below that is Pythagoras' way of describing this, how we evolved the scale. As you can see, this one has got a, a frequency ratio to the C note. The C note is shown as one by one. That's meaning that the frequency, whatever frequency you select, that is a C note. The D note is got as nine eighths of the first note, the C frequency. The E note is uh, 81 by 64 of the C note. Similarly, the F note and the G note is what you must pay attention to. That is a three by two ratio. That is with a fixed power. That's a three by two ratio that he selected. And his circle of fifths and everything comes from this particular note. He, Pythagoras got a scale based on the G note, which is the par note, on the three by two uh, uh, ratio, and that led to the circle of fifths that I showed about. And if you see the uh, uh, frequency ratio between the notes in the last line, you see that they are a perfect nine by eight, nine by eight, from from the uh, from E to F, which is just one uh, semitone. It is two fifty six by two forty three. So you see a very interesting scale coming out. So the Pythagorean tuning is a system of musical tuning in which the frequency ratio of all intervals of bass ratio 3 is to 2. This ratio is known as a pure perfect fifth. It is chosen because it is the most consonant and easiest to tune by ear. And also the number 3 was important for him. Because the number 3 was important, he proposed this 3 by 2 ratio in all of these things. Let us remember that Samagana started with 3 notes. Just as a point of reference, we know it started with three notes. Having done that, I have also put in the very last table there the various modes of what they typically call in Western music is Ionian, Dorian, and other such things. It is just a permutation of the tone, tone, semitone, as you can see over there. If you just rearrange one tone, go back in a round robin fashion, you see all the various notes appearing over there. This is the so-called uh, Lydian scale, which you can observe the same as a Kalyani Raga. So you have a, a tone, 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 and then you have a, a, a semitone, two whole tones, and a final semitone. So this is a typical Kalyani Raga, and the Greek Lydian and the modern Lydian scale, based on Pythagorean scales, are exactly this kind of a scale coming out of that. This is a table which contains a lot of mathematical information, but is useful for us to try and see as far as the frequency and the sense are concerned, as compared to the Shrutis and as compared to the Pythagorean. There's a lot of information over here where we can see the correspondence, how the Shruti system seems to have impacted the Pythagorean scales, but the differences between the notes and these kinds of things. So at this point, because there is so much of math involved in the Pythagorean system, I'd like to bring in the question, would Pythagoras have been influenced by Indian math and would that have given some correspondence to music also? It's just a line of thinking over here. I'd like to see how far we can take this line of thinking. So we know in Silva Sutras, it's part of the Kalpa Sutra. It's one of the six uh, disciplines of Vedanga, appendix to the Yajur Veda. The major, major Silva Sutras are credited to Apastamba, Bodhayana, Manava, and Katyayana. And there is a lot of math in the Apastamba and the Bodhayana uh, Silva Sutras. It talks about right angle triangle, geometry, square roots, numerals, and there's also the concept of zero from Paninian rules also is over there. So, Shatrapata Brahmana shows an understanding of all the altar constructions from the Silva Sutras. 
and we can date the Shatapata Brahmana based on the Kritika reference in astronomy to 3000 BC or earlier, which is written by Yajnavalkya. So this implies that Sulva Sutras derived from a tradition more ancient than 3000 BC in order to uh, do this. In my earlier talks, I've also proposed that knowledge was transferred to West Asia around 1800 BCE following the drying up of the Saraswati River. And there's a reasons why I'm saying this. If you look at some of the earlier talks that I've made, we will see what kind of Indic thought impacted from India into Hittites, the Mitannis, the Elamites, Canaanites, the Egyptians, in terms of Ayurvedic knowledge, in terms of mathematical knowledge. There appears to be a lot of clues for somebody who wants to go and study the impact of Indian thought on these cultures. So taking that idea further, as an example, the Sulva Sutra talks about square root of two. For example, Sulva Sutra in, in verse 2.12, it says the measure is to be increased by its third, and this third again by its own fourth, less the 34th part of that fourth. And that is the diagonal of the square, the square root of two. This algorithm we know is based on mathematical successive approximation by averaging. And you can see below that square root of two can be expressed in modern notation as this particular uh, uh, entity that I've shown over here. The picture shows a Babylonian cuneiform tablet from 1700 BCE in the Yale connect uh, the collection. This also shows a square root of two by a strange kind of formula on the 60s on the base system which modern scholars are trying to say, how did they even evolve this? And there are some modern day interpretations, but I'm proposing that the inspiration came from Silver Sutras in a base 60 system to do this. So given that some knowledge is exchanged, we'd like to see what else. Can there be a connection of Silver Sutras to Pythagoras? That's the next question. So it turns out that Pythagoras today is best known for his Pythagorean theorem. But what most people don't know is that he also believed in the idea of soul transmigration, reincarnation. He believed in that concept. He became a pure vegetarian after visiting India. He visited India, went back to USA and stopped eating meat. He only ate vegetables, fruits, and uh, nuts, and these kinds of things. Had no wine or beans or any meat. And he said that constant working towards an attainment of bodily purification and purity in order to be able to interact with the divine, cosmos is the word that he coined, meaning universe. From the Indic philosophies from Vedanta, it seems very certain that he wants to purify his body and mind to understand Brahman. So that is the ideas that he brought to the discourse. Then next I put one more quote. He <coughs> saw music as a holy, spiritual, scientific endeavor. So why would that ever happen in a culture where music is got for entertainment and dance and so on? In India, music has always been a samadhana with uh, spirituality, holiness, and these things. And Pythagoras also brought the same idea, not for dancing and entertainment, for a spiritual uh, endeavor. So he promoted what became the basic fundamental idea of all music theory from antiquity to modern times, that by dividing the length of a string into ratio of half, thirds, and so on, the octave can be got. You can very soon realize the Silver Sutras were all based on chords, basically the string, and making formulas and lengths and angles out of the string and working with that. So the same kind of mathematics has been internalized by Pythagoras, and he used the string to evolve the ratio of the various intervals and the distances to make his music. So that's where I'm proposing that there needs to be more research for potential connection into Pythagoras' inspiration from Samadhana and others to evolve his own uh, uh, Western music system. So here I put over here, Pythagoras lived in 570 BCE, and these people, Albert Berkey, uh, Ian Marlowe, and G.R.S. Mead, they all proposed that Pythagoras visited India, and that's where he got his knowledge from. And uh, one more very interesting thing to talk about Pythagoras is, when he arrived at a town called Croton, his first advice to them was, build a shrine to muses at the center of the city to promote civic harmony and learning. Muses is a female divinity, and in India we know that we worship Saraswati for learning and for music. So he took the same concept as the divinity called Muses, and he wanted to build a statue of, for her at the library, center of the library, so people could worship her for learning and for music. So like I said, he, practiced, he, he was a vegetarian, he formed a Gurukulam style of school where he was the Acharya in charge, his bachelor disciples were around him getting his wisdom, 
and the outer circle were students on the way to the inner circle. Same Gurukulam was adopted by Socrates, by Plato, Aristotle, all got the same kind of Gurukulam school. In the Gurukulam school, they had an Upanishadic kind of teaching where there's a question and answer kind of uh, learning mechanism, where you ask a question, answer is given, sometimes recursion is there in the question. So it's very interesting to see all the Vedantic concepts and learning that Pythagoras has internalized. And I'm proposing that music also could have been part of what he took from India and introduced to the West. So here are the interesting connections between Pythagoras and Indian music. The Silva Sutra does mathematics with strings. Pythagoras used string ratios to define the notes in, in music. Samavida started with three notes. Three is a sacred number for Pythagoras, and three by two ratio the starting point for his scale definition. Samavidic swara system has got seven notes. Diatonic music of Pythagoras also has got seven notes. From 22 shrutis, we get 12 semitones and seven swaras. However, in the Pythagorean system, he does not talk about shrutis. He simply talks about semitones and notes, a simpler form, if you will. Swaras are associated with divinities. The music for Samaveda chants uh, were used for Samavedic chants initially. Pythagoras, we see, has considered music as holy and spiritual. Finally, in the Indic concept, he takes Saraswati as a patron of learning and music. In Pythagoras, he saw the female divinity Muses as a patron of learning and music. All of these are the interesting connections I'm bringing out between Pythagoras and Indian music to propose that in addition to mathematics, in addition to technology, sciences, astronomy, the Greeks also might have borrowed Indian music. But we are told that it evolved independently in these various world cultures. That idea needs to be critiqued and researched further. So that is at the uh, end of part one, and the, and the five minutes, Chairman, uh, and the five minutes, I think. Okay, uh, so just talk about evolution of musical instruments, and I question which came first, scales or instruments. We know that in Pimbetka there are rock art 12,000 years ago showing dancers, which means also drums and music over there. Rig Veda, we know a lot of music is mentioned, for example, the flute, as the, as the Venu is mentioned, the Dundubi is mentioned, the Vana, uh, the, Vina, the Vina is also mentioned over here, and uh, various instruments over there. In Natya Shastra, Bharat Muni says there are four kinds of instruments, string instruments, wind instruments, percussion instruments, and solid instruments that don't require tuning, some examples given over there. The Bansuri flute, mentioned in Rig Veda, Natya Shastra, it is also one of the artifacts found in Harappa, so that, that is a very, very interesting uh, concept over there. Veena mentioned in Rig Veda, Atharva Veda, Taitriya Samhita, Shatapata Brahma, Natya Shastra, also has gone through an evolution from the early Veena to the final time. This was a gentleman called Shail Vyas. In 2016, he worked on reconstructing the instruments of the Indus Valley civilization. And here are the pictures of him where he used, oops, on the, the first one shows a bull and a lyre kind of a early Veena kind of instrument and metal drums, instead of the gutam that we use, he uses the metal drums to uh, do that. Very, very interesting. The Nadaswaram, Nadaswaram, I'm questioning, was the inspiration for the trumpet that is seen in Egypt and other places, especially in the biblical music, you see the trumpet used for bringing down the walls of Jericho and these kind of things. Nadaswaram has been mentioned in the earliest Tamil literature, so it's a very, very ancient instrument in the Indian context. Then finally, the Ravana Hatha the ancestor of violin. We know that this humble instrument was an inspiration for the violin that we see today. And uh, I've given an etymology of how that happened from this book. And you also see the picture down there showing an Arab gentleman in Cairo, 7th to 10th centuries. Arabs introduced an instrument, it's called riba, and from there it went to Europe and became the violin. Percussion, the earliest ones have been found in China, but in the Indian context we know from the earliest Shiva iconography we have there. Western claims, as usual, it talks about something completely disconnected with what we Indians are used to, and there's some great antiquity for some of the instruments. There is a claim that there's a 35-year-old, 35,000-year-old uh, 35, bone flute in Germany, but there's some skepticism whether it's a flute or chewing by bears on a bone. 8,000 years ago in China, they recovered seven whole flutes. Very, very interesting. Seven whole flutes show the swara system was present in China at an early point, Perhaps through a diffusion of Rig Veda uh, concepts, Samaveda concepts into uh, China at that time frame. So this one talks about how they used the bird's uh, uh, bone, hollowed bone, to make this one. It's recovered from the grave of a musician. This is the musician. In his grave, they found seven or eight flutes. 
There appears to be some disputed music from, uh, from uh, Sumeria, Professor Anne Drafcon Kilmer. She proposes that the mathematics in a, in a cuneiform tablet actually is a music score. And there appears to be a Lydian tablet or scale that we talked about, the seven note music. The Egyptians seem to have music in their, uh, uh, in their uh, ethnography. And you can see the lute and other things. The lyre was used in Greece. And finally, I will talk to you about the mathematics of music. We know that Pingalas and Hemachandras, uh, binary mathematics and others, led to rhythm patterns. And one of the uh, famous person who talks about in recent times is uh, Dr. Manjul Bhargava. He talks about how uh, music can give rise to rhythm patterns, prosody, and these kind of things. And uh, my very last slide, Konakol, Konakol rhythm. Almost all of us in social media have seen this by now and a very, very interesting exponent of verbal rhythm patterns based on the so-called Fibonacci series of the numbers. So that is my concluding remarks. So I hope I have uh, uh, demonstrated that the roots of music is in Samaviva, the division of octave by Shruti and Swara in the Chandogya Upanishad. The three note to seven note music evolution is seen perhaps via the five note uh, syntonic music. We examine Pythagorean music, we propose study of silver shudras to show the evolution of scale in Western music. We show the antiquity of some musical systems and connection between math, prosody, and rhythm. I hope this talk has been interesting to you. Thank you very, very much.